to put an end to this delightful evening let's move ahead without further ado inviting dina preston and michael preston famously known as alex rutherford in the reading community and andrew otis an acclaimed journalist and a historian for conversation on a passage to india the outsider's perspective with jonathan gill harris an acclaimed scholar teacher and director of shakespeare can we please have them on stage with a, a huge round of applause So they say, of course, the sun never sets on the British Empire, but the sun did set. And as the sun sets, uh, British people come out to talk to you. Uh, at least some of us are British. Uh, two are British, one is American. I'm actually Indian, much to your surprise, although I'm originally from New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, the outsider's perspective on the inside, the outsider looking in. Uh, the first question I want to ask, and uh, I, I just want to apologize in advance, I've been informed that I'm a panelist as well as moderator, so um, you're not going to be treated to the spectacle of me asking myself questions. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, open up conversation as much as possible, but I'll be perhaps chiming in more than uh, moderators normally do. Um, I think it would be useful for the audience uh, to just hear a little bit about um, what you have written on, what drew you to India and to write about India? Maybe we can start with you, Andrew. Certainly. Um, I'm sort of the random American in the bunch. And um, to be absolutely honest with you, I, I came because I found a good story. And that story was India's first newspaper. Um, I didn't have any background in uh, India. I actually didn't know anything about Indian history uh, when I first came across Hickey's Bengal Gazette. And so the five years, six years it took writing this book, um, I think if you had asked myself before I started writing, I would never have described myself as someone who has a deep knowledge in one particular area of India's history. And I never set out with that intention. And I still you know, don't really describe myself as someone who is um, knowledgeable about, about Indian cultures, Indian societies. Um, I know one area, and I know it well. but. I'm still an outsider and I'm still looking in. I'm still an American first and I still have an American perspective on life and um, how we view things. And Diana, Mike? Um, I'll try and speak for both of us until I get corrected. <laughs> but I think it's true to say that our, the start of our writing about India really came out of our love of traveling in India. We came to India very soon after we got married, which as you can tell by looking at us was a long time ago. And we then came back to India many times after that, long before we started about to think about writing on Indian themes. And when we did start to think about writing, it was an iconic building that we focused on, a universal symbol. We could perhaps you know, spend a lot of time discussing what it symbolizes to all of us here. But of course, the Taj Mahal, and then from researching that, came the Mughal novel, so that was the genesis. But long before starting to write about India, it was our travels here that I think first captivated us, caught our imagination, caught our attention. I think the, on the only other thing to say is I don't think we either think of ourselves as experts in any particular field. Yeah. Um, and just to fill people in, in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, uh, I wrote a book uh, called The First Farangis, which is about uh, people who migrated to India before the time of colonialism, uh, often from the West, but also from Africa, from East Asia. And they became, in a way, Indian. These were Pardesis who became Desi. Um, so to a certain extent, what I was trying to do was uh, sort of understand the prehistory of something that I saw myself doing uh, which was negotiating uh, 
the challenge of being a migrant to this country, uh, finding myself immersed in its extraordinarily rich array of civilizational traditions. Um, so let me ask you, what kind of knowledge can an outsider, even though you claim not to be experts, it, you still know a lot about what you've ended up writing about? And to what extent does your position as an outsider actually grant you perspectives that may not necessarily be immediately available to, uh, to Indians or to your Indian readers? Yeah, I can start with this. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'll answer this question um, sort of by going a little bit my my back history and, and a little bit more about how I got into writing about Hickey's Bengal Gazette. Um, like I said, I, I didn't have a background in Indian history. In fact, I was a total blank slate, a tabula rasa. Uh, and, and I think that helped in many ways. Um, there had been a lot written about the time period of Warren Hastings and a lot of uh, this you know, time period of the early East India Company was very vitriolic in one sense, maybe uh, very um, post-colonial, very much anti the, the, the East India Company. And, and before that, of course, was the British imperialist historians who would uh, support Hastings' uh, regime because it supported the, the purpose of empire. And I came in and I, I knew nothing. I didn't know any of this coming in. I had to teach myself all of the background. and. I think I, that was actually very helpful because I had a total, I, I didn't know what to expect. And so I don't think I, if I can use this word, I don't think I was corrupted by uh, sort of a lot of the politics that are involved in writing about history. And I didn't really have a stake. You know, I, di I didn't have a, a bias going into it. And I think that really helped me, if I can say so, write a more honest picture, a more nuanced picture of life and society uh, at this time. And what about you, Diana, Mike? In the sense that what we've written about, we started with a blank, uh, blank sheet as well. Hold, hold uh, it a bit closer to you. Okay, yes. we started on a blank sheet as well, uh, because the real thing we know most about, from which everything has branched out, is the construction and reasons for, and the design of the Taj Mahal. Perhaps that's the only thing we can claim to be very knowledgeable about, and a little bit, of course, about Mughal history too. And perhaps just to say a little bit about our academic background, that uh, when I was at university, I studied history, Mike studied ancient languages and things. So we had some academic grounding in how to look at source material, how to try and weigh it up, how to try to be objective and take very much Andrew's point that we all carry a certain amount of stuff with us. And you think you're trying to be fair and, and unbiased and you can never totally succeed in that. But we had, I suppose, some of the uh, instruments in the toolkit to help us, whether we, which we would employ, whether we're writing about Indian history or indeed other periods of history in other countries, which we've also covered. Can you tell us a little more about the, the Taj Mahal um, in light of uh, the, the framing of the session of the outsider looking in, that the Taj Mahal on the one hand is the exemplary Indian structure. On the other hand, in terms of its construction, so much from outside the subcontinent mm -hmm. ended up sort of becoming part of yeah. uh, its design, its, its construction. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, it it's struck us. It was a really interesting aspect, this. You say to anybody, what is the most famous building in the world? And probably 98% of people will probably say Taj Mahal. And it's absolutely the iconic image of India. It's in all the India tourist advertising, you know, incredible India campaign, all of that. And yet, when you look at the elements that went into it, it is such a fusion building. I mean, in our research, it took us to Central Asia, to Samarkand, to the tomb of Timur, ancestor of the first Mughal emperor. And you look at the tomb of Tamburlaine or Timur there, you see the, the dome and the uh, recessed arches and the raised gateway. So many features of the Taj Mahal. And then we also went to Persia, Iran, because of course the empress for whom the Taj Mahal was built was Persian. Her grandfather, 
who became known as Itamid Udala, of course, had come to the court of Akbar, from the Persian court to the Mughal court, to make his fortune part of that great reservoir of talent from Persia that arrived in Mughal India in Akbar's time. But also when you look at other elements of the construction of the Taj, you see so much that is Hindu. There's beautiful little, sometimes they call them kiosks, you know, those little chatteries that sit around the, the dome that appear to frame that great dome. The ability to carve. You see it in, of course, the sandstone carving of Fatipur Sikri as well. But you see that very skillful Hindu carving in the Taj. You see uh, inlaid jewel work. Sometimes people say, oh, this is obviously strongly influenced by Europeans. But no, I mean, the, the technique of inlay panchikura, I think it's called, goes way back in the Hindu tradition. So if you like all these elements of what have been going on, waves of people coming into India, sorry, I'm competing with the traffic, I hope you can hear me, um, are all exemplified in that absolutely, to, to my eyes anyway, perfect building. If I could add to that, still on? Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say that I was surprised myself in, in the level of multiculturalism. I, I, I don't want to use that word in the modern sense of, uh, of, of you know, integration in the same way, but there was an incredible amount of people, at least in my own research, that I, that I encountered who I would have never expected in India. Um, and my book, there's a Swedish missionary who was trained in Germany who then went to England and then went to India. The main protagonist is an Irish lower class journalist. There were Jews, there were Parsis, there were Americans, there were Irish, there were, you know, I mean, that's beyond just a different uh, peoples in India. And I think I was quite surprised by that. Um, of course, doesn't, I don't mean to whitewash history, you know, but the fact that there was um, an incredible amount of diversity. And I one think of, one of the things that I think struck me was that the man who founded Yale University made all his money in India, which really did surprise me. In <laughs> Chennai, yep. yeah. But um, I think this is a point worth stressing, uh, that um, India as a singularity is to a certain extent uh, a fantasy, that it has always been not only multicultural, um, which is a very modern word, it has always been more accurately a conversation between many, many cultural traditions. Uh, and this was certainly something that became apparent to me when I was doing my research for the first Ferengis, that a lot of objects, traditions, uh, even ways of thinking that we regard as iconically Indian have some kind of Ferengi trace in them. And I'm not talking about British colonialists or Portuguese colonialists, but often poor migrants who made their way to the subcontinent, often escaping oppression in Europe and other parts of the world, who came here, who learned local languages, who sometimes married Indians, had Indian children, and uh, their skills became incorporated into what was already a vibrant multicultural conversation. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, everyone's heard of the pe peacock throne, the tak de tabus. Uh, and we think of it as ours, and it was taken by them, the outsiders, by Nadir Shah, the, the, the Persians. Uh, but the Tak De Tavus was, to a certain extent, a collaborative uh, project. Uh, it was ordered uh, by Shah Jahan, uh, but uh, it required uh, the work, the contribution, of a very interesting character named Hunermand, which, of course, in Persian, Urdu means skillful. But this Hunermand is, in fact, the only Ferengi mentioned by name in uh, Jahangir's uh, memoirs. Uh, Hunermand was in fact a Frenchman, a counterfeiter who was very good at counterfeiting jewels, who got involved in shady business in Europe and scarpered to uh, Ajmer and uh, found employment with Jahangir and then with Shah Jahan. And they valued him for his knowledge of uh, jewels and uh, French artisanal uh, traditions that they incorporated into the Takte Tavus. That's just one example of the extent to which India has been always a conversation with not India. Uh, and I think that's important to remember at a time where we're getting a lot more um, assertive about the borders between what is Indian, what isn't Indian, to the point where Indians are now finding themselves taken off
national registers of citizenship. But I wanted to ask you, Andrew, about Hickey. Um, I mean, an intriguing point of connection between uh, what you work on and what uh, Andrew works on is the word Akbar. Uh, Akbar, the emperor, is also the name for a newspaper. And uh, you were describing, to a certain extent, the birth of modern Indian journalism. Um, now, to what extent can Hickey's Gazette be thought of as part of an Indian conversation? Or is it simply a vestige of colonialism uh, that is somehow foreign to India? Is the Akbar that he produced <laughs> foreign or Desi? Uh, that's um, a great question because it requires sort of a complicated answer. Uh, and I say that because Hickey's Bengal Gazette was an English language newspaper, primarily for the merchant community in Calcutta, which was uh, mostly uh, Europeans, Anglo-Indians, and so forth. And that was his target audience. But if you look at sort of the longer legacy of the first newspaper in India, you see that it, there's actually a bit more than just that. And, and what I mean is the first uh, Indian-owned newspaper was founded around 1820, uh, that I'm aware of at least, and it was called the Bengal Gazette. It was founded by a Bengali called Ganga Kishore Bhattacharya. And it turns out that he was an apprentice or at least had deep connections with a man named Paul Ferris. Paul Ferris was one of Hickey's apprentices. So I like to say there's sort of a family tree of, of learning the printing trade in Calcutta. And that tree really started with Hickey and Hickey's assistants who launched their own newspapers. And then some of these assistants that they had were Indians and they launched their own newspapers, which began a very vibrant, as we know it uh, today, the Indian uh, uh, media system. So that's just a little taste that there's, there's there's so much more complexity than just on the surface, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. If I can just dwell uh, on Hickey for a bit, Andrew, uh, there are some intriguing episodes that didn't make their way into your book, um, most notably about Hickey's uh, personal life. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the figure of Rosa, yeah. uh, who may or may not have been Hickey's Bibi? So, and, uh, Great question because uh, Rosa de Rosario, who um, as often as the case in history, you really have to read through the lines to figure out what's going on. And as doubly often, especially with women in history, it's really difficult to figure out often what, what happened to their lives because often history is about the men. Um, what I do know is that Hickey had around uh, 11, 12, 13 children, but I don't know who he was having these children with. Was he cohabitating with this woman? Was, were they married? Where did she come from? What was her name? I, I suspect her name was Rosa de Rosario, and I, I only know that because I was reading through court documents, and she comes up as a witness who was living in his house, and particularly by her testimony, I was cued off that I suspected that they had some type of relationship. She came from the Anglo-Indian community. I suspect that she was Portuguese uh, based upon her last name, which was sort of a catch-all term for anyone who was of mixed heritage. Um, and I, I suspected that they um, had a relationship because of her position in the testimony, where she was placed in the house uh, this was actually an incident that was involving Hickey and a mob that come to his house and sort of uh, an angry drunk mob that um, uh, for whatever reason wanted to break in and sort of violate his household. She was in the house at the time and he told her, like, go, look, go to the back room, call the constable, call the, 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 the chokidar and tell them to come here immediately because it's not safe. So do this, please do this now. And so she runs to the back room. And it's a more conversation that sort of really cued me off, like, she might be important in a way that history doesn't record. And in some regards, I sort of regret leaving her out of my book. Um, I, d I left her out because I didn't have proof. Um, I could only suspect, basically, my gut suspicion. Uh, but I think, really, her story and many others like her deserve to be told. Yeah.
Do, do we know what happened to Hickey's children? Were they shipped back to uh, um, Ireland or England? Uh, that's a, a great question again. Uh, frankly, I, I tried my utmost to track down his descendants. Um, I know some died in India. Yeah. Uh, I suspect others worked for the, they were sergeants or lower class um, members of the East India Company Army. And so they integrated with India, and today they are probably part of the Anglo-Indian community. Right. But beyond that... So there may be Indian descendants of Hickey. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, there may be, but I can't prove it. <laughs> so, um, Alex, yeah. uh, Mike and Diana, um, when we're talking about the Mughals, again, we're talking about something that is iconically Indian. Yet, uh, Babur was, of course, a migrant. Um, and the Babur Nama is, in some ways, uh, a migrant's account of, uh, of Hindustan. Uh, so um, when uh, you were doing your research for your, your marvelous series, uh, to what extent did you find uh, that uh, the Mughals were seeing themselves as outsiders looking in and insiders looking out simultaneously? I, I think our perception in reading the the Babu Nama, which was, uh, uh, as we were saying the other day, you know, chief source into Babu's mind, was that I don't think he had that sense so much of other or the outsider. I think we're reading very much the engaging account of um, an opportunist, <laughs> you know, who saw himself as the inheritor of this tremendous legacy. Not so much Genghis Khan. He wasn't quite so proud of that strand in his heritage, but immensely proud of being the descendant of Timur. And that's why all these attempts to take Samarkand, and when that eventually didn't work out, arrived in Kabul, which he heard conveniently fallen vacant. I was able to move in there. I then heard of a place of great wealth to the south, Hindustan. And I made various attempts, as we all know, to invade into Hindustan and then came and won the Battle of Panipat. But in doing all of that, I think he, was, he saw himself as fulfilling the destiny of his much revered ancestor, Timur, who of course come all the way to Delhi and sacked it so thoroughly that I think in the Chronicles it said not a bird sang for six months and we have accounts of all these camel loads of loot going back. I mean, I think Barbour was attracted by what he saw as the opportunity and the wealth. And I don't think, I think, you know, we tend to think of this business of, are you an outsider? Are you an interloper? What are you doing? Um, but of course, he arrived in Hindustan and the people he displaced were relatively new arrivals anyway, because the people he defeated at Panipat were the Lodi sultans who had come out of Afghanistan themselves. So I think to sort of to try and backfit perceptions of otherness and the outsider, um, into Babur's mind. But he did certainly, having arrived in Hindustan, forgive me, I'm repeating what I touched on yesterday, but he did regard it as somewhere new and different yes. because he said that, you know, had it really been all worth the effort and where were the gardens and the palaces and was the fruit going to be as good as he remembered on the other side of the Khyber Pass? Yes. And then the wealth and everything that he came across yes. uh, made him think that he'd actually made a very wise move. Uh, so, I think this is a wonderful reminder that uh, at this time, ideas of nations with borders simply didn't exist. And a lot of our uh, conceptual architecture of inside and outside belongs to an age in which there are borders, in which there are um, uh, immigration offices, in which we carry passports. Um, but uh, the way in which uh, people inhabited space was so different at a time where what, if anything, united people was not necessarily a sense of nation, which did not yet exist, but roots. Uh, that uh, Hindustan was very much part of uh, a trade and culture nexus that linked it to what is now Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. Um, I was really struck by this. You mentioned the food, that Babur was uh, wondering, am I going to find decent food in Hindustan? I, I was uh, just in uh, Tashkent and Samarkand uh, a few weeks ago. And what's the word for pomegranate there? Anar. Anar. What's the word for grape? Angur. What's the word for meat? Gosht. So we can see in language the extent to which thoughts, people have constantly moved across what we now regard as absolutely fixed borders. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, 
One of the things which, which we were intrigued by was that the Tandoor had arrived with Babo's army, because what a brilliant mechanism for cooking when you have an army on the move. Yes. So yeah, a big pot that you can heat up very, very hot and throw your food quickly into it. And yet what an integral part of the food of the subcontinent, the Tandoor, is today. Yep. And uh, an Indian chef told us that because the Mughals didn't get right to the very far south, that's why Tandoors aren't used down in the south. Yes. Um, of course, when Hickey arrived in India, it was the East India Company was uh, running the show to a large right. extent. And so ideas of borders had begun to appear in sort of very different ways from what had been understood before. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, but these borders were not simply between outsiders and insiders. Even within the British establishment, there were outsiders and insiders. And Hickey, as an Irishman, was definitely an outsider within uh, the British uh, colonial establishment. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, exactly. Um, I just want to say one thing. I mean, there was no such thing as a passport in this time in history, right? It, it just didn't matter. If you could... And that's relevant because... Hickey comes to India as a surgeon's mate. It's an assistant to a surgeon on an East India ship. What that means is that he probably had no more than a year or two years of medical training, if he had any at all, and that was probably by paying a couple pennies to watch some surgery or reading a couple medical textbooks. He jumps on a ship. He comes to India. He jumps ship, right? He just gets off the boat tells the captain, bye, or doesn't tell the captain at all, leaves, right? And so I think it's important to note that especially at the lower classes, yeah. you just show up. Um, and Hickey was motivated by money when he first came to India, as many were. Uh, he didn't have much opportunity in life. His father was a weaver. Father died when he was young, so he was essentially orphaned. Um, I will say, though, that the East India Company around this time started to um, require permission for its um, employees, the East India Company servants, to move further inland from Calcutta. And that was really only enforced if there was a political grudge that was happening. Uh, usually it didn't really matter. Um, but let's say you got on the bad side of the governor. The governor could say, oh, well, you don't have any right to be in Kanpur or Delhi. Bye. But for most people, most Europeans at this time, you could pretty much go wherever you wanted as long as you stayed below the radar, or if you were poor enough not to matter. I'm so interested that Hickey sort of arrived in the subcontinent as a medical expert, because this is something that is something, it's, it's a common theme over the centuries, that Ferengis arrive in the subcontinent, and regardless of whether they've actually had medical training, they become doctors. And it wasn't simply that they were shysters uh, looking to, to dupe Indians. It's that uh, a lot of Indians believe that Ferengis had some kind of almost preternatural ability in, in medicine. Um, and we find this, of course, amongst the Mughals, where there were over and over again Ferengi doctors. Uh, are, are there any such characters that you came across in your yes, studies? Yes, we did come across several. As you say, that they were probably completely wrongly revered for their medical <laughs> skills. And we did uh, find an account of one doctor who was invited into one of the great Mughal harams, one of the zananas, because a woman had fallen ill. And he said he was led with something over his head, a cloth, so he couldn't see too much, and taken into the presence of this lady. And he said he then tried, uh, as far as he could, to take her pulse. But it was incredibly difficult because she had so many ropes of gems and pearls wound around her arms that he couldn't find a right bit where he could actually measure what her, her pulse was. So it, it had its difficulties, but you're quite right that they were regarded as having yep. particular particular knowledge, and I believe, if I, my recollection is correct, I think there was an example of stories of a doctor who was consulted when a Princess Jahanara uh, got badly burned in a fire, you know, Shah Jahan's daughter, her flimsy muslin robe got caught by candlelight, she was very badly burned, um, so much so that it was feared she would die, and they did consult a European physician. I think it's not clear whether what he prescribed was able to help. But of course, she did, she did survive. 
um, I believe that was Niccolo Manucci, the, yes. the, the man who came into the harem, who was in fact a runaway, a working class runaway, the child of a sweeper from Venice, who arrived in India when he was just 15. And uh, word got around that, uh, that uh, noblemen were looking for Ferengi doctors, so he basically presented himself, and lo and behold, he was a doctor all of a sudden. But yes, no, we, we, lo <laughs> we loved his account. I mean, he was. <laughs> there are so many accounts written by so many really tremendous rogues who were arriving in the Mughal Empire in this period, and they, they are just magnificent reading, and you've got to discount quite a bit of what they say, I think. So. What uh, lessons, if any, can we learn from the pasts that you have uh, researched for your books? Um, Andrew, um, is there anything that Hickey can tell us now, uh, nearly uh, 200 years later, well, more than 200 years later? 230. 230 years later, about the, the press, about journalism. All right, and that's the classic question I got all the time. Why should we care, right? Why should we care about any of the work that we do involving history? Um, I think it's important to look back. Um, there's always a saying, right, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. Well, okay, sure, yes. But I think it's always important to look back and realize the humanity of the people in the past. Um, I actually, I watched the movie uh, They Shall Not Grow Old um, the other day, and it's Peter Jackson had taken... World War I footage and had colorized it and increased the frames per second. And it's a, it's a beautiful film because you actually can realize that these people are human beings. They're not just, you know, black and white footage. You can see their humanity. And I think that's important one um, in terms of particularly for journalism in India. Um, this is obviously a very complicated thing to answer quickly. Uh, but I think it's important to, to realize Especially at the Times of India Especially at the Times of India, yes, yes. Um, I, I'll just quickly say that there is value of speaking truth to power, and that value often comes in terms of how you'll be judged in posterity. And of course, it's good to do the right thing. It's good to have good reporting, good professional reporting. Um, but I, I will say as a cautionary tale, it's also good to remember, you know, what your place is in history and how you're going to be remembered personally and how that should guide your actions. Yeah. yeah. And I think you absolutely put your finger on it when you mentioned the word humanity because we found when we were looking at the characters who came up in the different Mughal reigns, which although we're talking about big figures in history and you have a certain sort of image of them, they're all just... They were real people like us with the same impulses, thoughts, feelings, uh, failings, abilities, all those things. And to try, uh, 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 and their lives, when you look through them, you see sort of universal themes that still dominate modern life. And I think, I don't know if Mike would agree, but in terms of lessons, perhaps what impressed us most, because when you look at the Mughal story, you see almost like, 17th century revenge tragedy, this terrible cycle of violence within the family breaking out again and again. But one ruler later in his reign overcame that, and that was, of course, Akbar. As we were saying the other day, our inclusive ruler who invited everybody from whatever background to come to his court where all, if they had talent and ability, could thrive, and they could speak truth to power. Yeah. Probably the only one of the emperors you could say that that was necessarily true. And I think in this increasingly complex and difficult time that we're all living in with more and more walls and borders coming up everywhere. When you look back to those messages, so remarkable to think that we're looking at a man who was ruling in the 16th century. We wish we had some of those values around perhaps more widely in the world today. And I was just going to say one thing that always strikes me, a by-blow of contact between peoples. Uh, I often ask people what things do have one, two things, both beginning with C. One, the British brought to India, and one, people brought to Britain, um, which both countries have really benefited by, yeah. both beginning with C. And I don't think Andrew knows the one that I'm thinking about, the British bringing to India. Oh, this is very unfair. We'll put the question to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Or the, or the audience. <laughs> Two things beginning with C that uh, have sort of traveled in different directions. And, and are well-loved as well. We all love them. <laughs> 
Curry, yes, is the one that's come <laughs> this way. But what's the one, the one unequivocally good thing that the British brought to India? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Lagan. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Cricket, not really. Lagan itself, <laughs> <laughs> not yeah, the, okay. I, the not the legal Lagan, but uh, the film. So yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe uh, this is a good point at which to open things up for questions, because I'm sure you want to know more directly from uh, these wonderful authors. So, uh, yes, yeah, so do we have microphones that can uh, go around here? Um, we can share ours if you I'll want. I'll share with Diana. Yeah. Yep. I can just whisper. I can just whisper. Oh, there's a microphone coming now. <laughs> I think we'll need yours because yours is probably the loudest microphone on stage. So, yeah. Thank you for that uh, very uh, interesting discussion. So I had uh, a couple of questions, uh, if I may. Uh, firstly, on the question of the introduction of a newspaper, as you describe in your uh, volume, which I look forward to reading, if possible, uh, is there also a sense of the emergence of what Benedict Anderson called an imagined community. Can one speak of a kind of imagined community? Not necessarily a nation, even because there was no concept of nation at that time, but some kind of a sense of a commonality generated by the fact of people reading a newspaper at the same time, at the same moment, and cons considering themselves part of a kind of unified readership. That was one. And the second question, maybe anyone could take this up. Is there a sense of, uh, in the context you've looked at and in the particular stories you've told, of a kind of divergence from Edward Said's concept of Orientalism as having marked predominantly the relationship between the West and the East, marked by a kind of power relationship? So here we see different kinds of conversations which perhaps were predicated upon relationships of power, especially during the colonial era, but uh, perhaps taking a different turn. So in what way does the, do these stories depart from that narrative of Orientalist discourse? Thank you. First, so your first question was whether the newspaper created a sense of imagined community among its readership. Is that correct? Um, I find that difficult to, one I find it difficult to answer because I'm not quite sure what you mean by the particular phrase imagined community. I know of sort of it in the academic sense, um, but I'm really hesitant to use jargon in, in that way. Um, I will say that um, I use the term the first newspaper in India. I don't quite use the term the first Indian newspaper. And I, and I use that term, I, I differentiate specifically to, to, to say that this was a newspaper founded by an outsider, an Irishman, right? And it involved many issues that were near and dear to the heart of the Indian community in Calcutta and around. Um, anything from, uh, especially fires that would happen in the city of Calcutta, which uh, displaced thousands. One particularly horrendous fire, um, 15,000 people went without homes, hundreds died. And Hickey's Bengal Gazette covered that with a a sense of humanity, I think, was quite remarkable for its time. Um, but it wasn't an Indian-owned paper that focused on Indians. It was a paper that generally for, was for the European merchant community. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that there weren't communities of Indians reading the paper, discussing it. Um, but I hesitate to make you know, the direct, I want to make a different, I want to differentiate between the two. Um, I will, t to answer imagined communities particularly, I, I will say that newspaper reading at this time in history was social. Um, you would often go to the cafe or you would read it in a group. One person would read the newspaper, five or ten other people would listen, right? And you would take turns discussing. So even because it had a very small circulation, there were communities of people reading it and sharing the ideas. And so that was community building. It wasn't nationalistic. It wasn't any sense of... I don't think it created a sense of national identity in any in any manner, um, but it did. I think it did form uh, a a sense of uh, camaraderie, um, especially especially with the lower ranks of the subalterns in in the East India Company army. They used the Hickey's Bengal Gazette as a way to share their experiences and especially to gripe and uh, against their superior officers. Uh, and that was quite dangerous, obviously, we know Indian history. Um, and this sense of community building would have really started with Hickey's Bengal Gazette. Um, maybe I can let you take the second part of the um, question. 
Power relationships, I think you're asking about. I think power relationships are nearly always wrong because in whatever walk of life between individuals, between companies, um, we should try and get away from exploiting power in general. And you're certainly right that in the history, the power relationship was seen in a way from uh, the Europeans and others exploiting the East. But those relationships change all the time as well. But I, th I think my big point is power relationships are never very good for anybody. They take away a lot of the humanity in a relationship. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. I have two questions actually. First is, wait, uh, you asked us originally what are the things that have flown across the ocean. So we answered cricket, but I don't know what is what went from here to there. Oh, curry. Oh, it, it's, okay. it's Britain's <laughs> favorite <laughs> dish, and that's shown by opinion polls. Every small town, every village, the village yeah. pub serves curry. I know that's not the right word to use, but in Indian food. But you know, you know uh, what we mean, and it's what every, everybody will do if you say, what are you doing on Friday night? That's the answer yeah. you'll usually get. Yeah, so, but yes, cricket and curry. And they're both indisputable facts without any connotations of good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. My second question is about your books, uh, especially the ones that I read, uh, Empire of the Mughal series. So when you would be researching, I can expect that you would have come across a lot of uh, resentment from the locals, Indians as we understand them, people who would have written their own accounts of when Baba came or Aurangzeb and the kind of, uh, I know it's a little bit political, but some oppression and things. So how do you how did you manage that, or how do you step over it? I don't know, Mike would agree with me. I think maybe we were very fortunate in the people that we talked to as we were going through our research, but I don't think that we encountered any... I think, I think you're talking about, actually, at the very time of Aurangzeb. We certainly oh. found lots of... We've always used translations, but we've often found translations of people who were very unhappy, obviously, with some of the things that Aurangzeb did. So uh, was your question to do with our own research, the contemporary research, or, or looking back at the time, looking at the chronicles? Well, I, when I read them, I often wondered how the account was very, very, uh, just uh, for lack of better words, uh, one-sided. I didn't see much of Indian side being told. Mm. Uh, of course, it was fictionalized version, so I respect that. Yeah. And mm. I wondered when you researched, why didn't you ever write from, uh, never even mentioned the other perspective? Um, because I think we were writing novels and we had to think about the narrative drive and we want, had to think about things like the point, point of view, you know, POV, as they always say. And it's a very different thing to when you're writing nonfiction. But we wanted to be inside. We had six main characters, and all the time we wanted to be inside their head to try and understand them. So we were trying to interpret the sources that were available to us, which, as Mike said, because you know our language abilities are limited, we were reading in translation, whether it was translation from the Babur Turkic through to uh, per Persian as the court language or Urdu documents or whatever. And we were trying to interpret and find our way through them to try and find the truth of the personalities that we were writing about as we perceived it. And we didn't perceive ourselves as having any particular agenda, if you like, to drive across, except to present to you, the reader, a well-rounded person that, whose motivation you could believe in. But we do include some things about the Maharatas, how they felt, some things about how the Sikhs felt. But yeah, our focus was probably on the characters, because it's a novel, it's got to be the main characters. So yes, we were looking at it from the point of view, we say history is about the victor, but well, we were looking at it from the Mughal perspective as they came into India and established themselves. But as, later on, as Mike says, as the novels developed, as, they, as things settled down and changed, caused major conflicts with, we, know, we talk a lot about the relationship with the Marathas Shivaji, which was a challenge to us to understand and interpret properly in a way that we hoped would resonate and peop you know, people would think that we'd given a fair portrayal here when we reached episodes like that. Yes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, you have appreciated in the diversity of Indian culture. 
and it's been brought about by the Mughals. They enriched India East culturally. Uh, however, when the British came, the colonial rule impoverished India, as they say, uh, from one of the richest nations became one of the poorest nations. Mm. But my point is that, uh, what do you think of India these days? Because uh, is our culture dividing us or uniting us? Because you just see the chaos outside, the drums, the traffic horns, you know, the way current India is uh, full of corruption. Uh, what do you think is happening, in your opinion? Can so, <laughs> <coughs> let me just say, I love the fact that, uh, you know, the band Baja was playing outside. <laughs> because here in India, it is impossible not to have some other world crashing into your private space. In fact, the idea of private space is, is a very difficult one to maintain here. It took me a while as a Westerner to get used to that. Uh, but you're constantly being interrupted. I like to joke that I'm being interrupted in seven different languages uh, all the time. Um, that can be annoying, but I think it's also one of the strengths of this place. Uh, I often like to joke about the fact that uh, in Indian roads, you have lanes drawn. But lanes are entirely notional. Right? Cars, in fact, keep swerving between, across the lanes. Now, we might get annoyed at that. We might complain about the lack of lane discipline. But I think it actually speaks to a long-standing habit here of straying across borders. And I'm actually being serious about this. Every one of us here, I'm sure, has had the experience of starting a thought in one language and finishing it in another. No? <laughs> right? I think that's something that's extraordinary about India, that uh, one has to not stay in one's own lane. If you stay just in one lane, or if you demand that every other lane become your lane, traffic gets congested. <laughs> uh, what has made this country so extraordinarily culturally rich is precisely this confluence of different languages, different cultural traditions, different religions. And you can see what the subtext of what I'm saying is, that the more that we insist that India is one thing, and not others, the more we commit violence against the reality on the ground of India's extraordinary mixture. I'm not going to speak about its corruption, but I love the fact that in India I'm always going to be interrupted by something that I haven't expected and usually in a language different from the one that I'm speaking right now. I'm Any more questions? No. Uh, yes, the gentleman at the front, and can we give him a microphone, please? A uh, small question for Mr. Otis. Uh, I hope, I mean, uh, he writes more books on India. I mean, is he planning more books on India? <laughs> uh, I'll, certainly, I'll certainly let you know when I think of my next topic. <laughs> That's my political answer to your question. <laughs> Yes. So uh, this is for um, Mike and uh, Diana. Uh, the, uh, where do you get your research from? Is it like mainly from India, or do you uh, get it from um, your museums? And it, we get it from a variety of sources. One of the main sources is the massive number of translations of sources that are available in Bari Bookshop in Khan Market. Uh, <laughs> But is this we, an advertisement? <laughs> yeah, this is not an advertising. We <laughs> but the other thing is for architecture, we try and visit everywhere we talk about. For example, the um, Archaeological Survey of India helped us go to Barampur, Burampur, where Mumtaz Mahal died and tried to show us the room in which she died, where they believe she died. They took us across the river to where she was first buried before she went to the was taken to the Taj Mahal. So part of it is trying to go along and experience what happened. Also, we were told, and we went to eat there, there is behind the um, uh, Red Fort in Delhi, uh, 
a restaurant that's kept by some of the moguls' cooks. We tried that. So in India, we experienced things. We used the archaeological survey in India, who are very good and helped us with papers and all those sorts of things. In Britain, we used our old university library in Oxford. We used the British Museum. And what we didn't use, which may surprise you, is our national archives, because all of the things that we were writing about, more or less without exception, were before there was very much British presence in India. Yeah. Yes, well, I'll just echo what Mike said and say, God, God bless Bari books. Orek <laughs> Savalva. <laughs> Again, counting on that. Source. Speak closer to the microphone if yeah. you can. So again, counting on that sources question. So basically, I want to ask that. Uh, so when you were researching on over the topics, to both of you, I'm talking about. So uh, whether there was any contradiction that you may face, because uh, from Indian point of view, when you talk, there were several uh, point of views, so which might be contradicting. But from third person account, who might have come from. Uh, from a, a foreigner ha might have come and he has given his own account that would have been a l like straightforward so whether w there was any contradiction and how did you deal with that if there was there is nearly always in writing any kind of history masses of contradiction between people people who write diaries write from all sorts of reasons for example they write to relieve pressure they write to try and prove they were right they only see partial numbers of things but to go back to your question, yes, we found contradictions. We basically tried to find the common thread if we'd got five different sources, what all of them agreed on. And then fortunately, because we we're writing novels, we could pick out from the things they don't agree with what we think is the most likely. Whereas when we're writing nonfiction history, you need to give the actual reference to show where you got mm. your information from. That's one of the ways yeah which uh, writing historical novels can free one a little. And I don't know if Andrew would agree with this, but one of the main things that when we're sort of sifting and trying to evaluate sources, which is one of the reasons why you try and collect as much material as you can, but is to ask yourself about the motivation of the person, why they were writing something, what was their purpose to explain, to excuse, but also to remember that sometimes people think they're being uh, absolutely accurate, but we all have faulty memories. <laughs> Any policeman taking a record of an incident from three or four witnesses will probably come up with some conflicting um, stories. You know, how do you find your way through that? It's the, the great trick, the great challenge to the historian, both in fiction and non-fiction. Yeah, it's my job to, to judge the credibility of a source. And I do that based upon many factors. Um, their motivations, how close to the time the source was written, um, you name it, right? And I have to basically use my judgment, and of course I cite everything in the process, to determine what I think is accurate and what I think is inaccurate. Um, and that's, I think that's the crux of a lot of the work that, that we do. We have time for one more question. Um, Uh, do the speakers think that uh, India was a liability for Britain or was it a boon? Because there's a new set of historians who argue that the empire didn't really benefit Britain, it distorted the character of British society. And now you've got, you know, when the empire has come home, you've got ethnic divisions as a legacy. And we saw a consequence of that just yesterday. So. How do, you, how do you look upon that phase of history? Gosh, that, that's a terrific question to but try and answer. I, uh. I, I think what all I would say is simply one should look at, uh, for example, um, there was a, a, an incident where uh, um, uh, a white Britain was berating some people of Jewish heritage on, the tr on an underground train recently. and. Uh, a woman who was of Brit is British, but of uh, heritage from the subcontinent, actually stopped them, uh, which to me showed that sometimes we're getting it right on diversity and those sorts of things, even though we obviously very often get it wrong. <laughs> well said. So, from Akbar to Akbar, under <laughs> under the sponsorship of another Akbar in the present. Um,
thank you to our panelists for an invigorating discussion and uh, thank you to the Times of India for giving us the space and uh, we can say good night and uh, farewell to the, uh, the festival. And thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome to come up and I'm sure all of us would enjoy more questions. Or I love questions. So.